All right. Um, so my presentation is um, hoping to contribute to the conversation in that I'm hoping to just give people a sense of how the laws, which you all know far more about than I do, given that Nipila um, Panskwazo, but how the laws all fit together. So, you know, the departments have often said to us, oh, you keep complaining about the laws, but what is actually the problem with the laws? Why are they so problematic? The hope is that this presentation um, would contribute towards when one answers that, it's very clear you don't need to lay it out for them. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just hoping that I will be able to explain how they fit together um, and the ways in which the uh, relationship between the different laws creates the type of situation that you see on the ground. So the overview of this session is uh, the session examines how the new laws promulgated by the government relate to one another by looking first at the national framework that's created by the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2003, which, as we all know, will be replaced by the Traditional and Khoisan Leadership Bill. We then move to looking briefly at the provincial laws, which are enacted uh, in line with the Framework Act. So many of those came um, into enactment in 2005. And those laws have had a very significant impact on the ground. Uh, then I'd like to look at the laws that um, have been promulgated under Section 20 of the Framework Act, specifically the CLRA, um, which we see resurrected in the upcoming Communal Land Bill, and then the TCB. Uh, and then briefly, I'd just like to speak about the way in which these new laws intersect with South Africa's living law jurisprudence. So to begin with, uh, the Framework Act. The Framework Act was, as I said, uh, came into law in 2003 and has been amended in 2009. And it sets up the provincial framework into which all of the provincial legislation slots. So the Framework Act contains the definitions, the recognition criteria, and the composition requirements um, for the various uh, positions that the Framework Act envisages in the traditional governance structure. So it defines senior traditional leader, it defines traditional community, it defines traditional council. There are certain provisions in the Framework Act which, when knitted together, create um, some of the very serious abuses that people are subjected to um, in their communities. So uh, even though it's slightly disjointed in that it's not in um, chronological order, the sections that I'd like to speak to specifically are Section 28, which is the transitional provision. Um, this is the deeply uh, politically controversial section. Um, it's the section that uh, people refer to when we say that the Framework Act and the current system entrenches the apartheid boundaries. I'd then like to look at Section 3, which is the composition requirements for traditional councils, and speak to the way in which these composition requirements were intended to be a safety valve. They were intended to be a mechanism that would make it okay for Section 28 to uh, entrench the apartheid boundaries. I'd also like to look at Section 22, which is the establishment of the Commission the commission that had the purpose of uh, dealing with traditional leadership disputes. And then I'd like to look at section 20, which is the guiding principles for the allocation of roles and functions and is in and of itself uh, a bit of a hidden bombshell within the act. So section 28, as I've said, uh, this is the part of the framework act that says that existing tribes, traditional leaders and tribal authorities, as they existed under the uh, oppressive regime, so as they were uh, created under pieces of legislation like the 1951 Bantu Authorities Act, will be deemed to be the traditional communities for tribes, the traditional councils for tribal authorities, and the official traditional leaders of the future for those traditional leaders that were recognized um, during the apartheid regime. And so what you, what you see in this section is quite literally a carrying over of the very same um, uh, concepts and the very same boundaries and definitions that were used to form those concepts. So those tribes were built on very contested boundaries, um, boundaries that people opposed through the Bantu Authorities Act and, and the op opposition to that act. Um, and those tribes and structures are carried by this section into the current democracy. Um, there were many objections, obviously, to cementing the outcomes of the BAA, given that there is such a deep historical resistance to them. Uh, the provision that would make this tran these transitional arrangements less offensive was that there would be composition requirements that were aimed at transforming these structures and making them more acceptable in a democratic dispensation. So th though this is a very contro controversial um, uh, act and a very controversial section, 
it was made slightly better by the fact that there was the promise of having these safety valves in the form of the composition requirements and the commission. So these composition requirements that I keep referring to are the requirements that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. It's the requirement that one third of the members of the traditional council need to be women. It's the requirement that 40% of a traditional council needs to be elected and 60% is appointed by the senior traditional leader. Now, interestingly enough, we've had the discussion that that 40-60 split is taken directly from um, the Bantu authorities' legislation um, and carried into this legislation. There were quite a few delays in terms of, in, fa in fact, there continued to be massive delays in terms of traditional councils meeting these requirements. There are provinces in which there have not been any elections. Limpopo is one. And in some provinces where there have been elections, those elections have been very deeply flawed, um, and research shows that some of them are actually completely invalid, which of course means then that the status of these traditional councils has a very large question mark hanging over it. If the, co if the composition requirements have not been met through valid elections, in some traditional councils, women might be on the council, but it's just window dressing. I know in KZN in particular, women on the council are told that you, you, know, you squat when you pee, therefore you have no um, valid voice to speak on this council. The question then becomes, are these traditional councils valid? They're certainly operating as if they're valid. They're transacting in mining deals, they are getting their salaries, they are issuing stamps and charging levies. They're continuing with um, the functions as if they were valid, but there is a real question mark and a potential um, possibility of a legal challenge over the status of these traditional councils. So we see here that the first safety valve mechanism that would make the transitional arrangements provision um, slightly less offensive appears to have failed because there really has been no monitoring of the elections. Finding election dates for traditional councils is really hard to do. Um, the IEC doesn't seem to have a very good handle on how these elections are happening. Um, and so we see the first safety valve mechanism really hasn't proved to give any safety at all. The second mechanism was the commission, what's commonly known as the Ntlapo Commission. So it was supposed to investigate the traditional leadership disputes. Um, and the idea was that if, even though you were carrying the recognized traditional leaders from the apartheid era into this new democracy, you would have this commission that would be able to disentangle who was the correct traditional leader and that it would also be able to disentangle some of the boundary disputes. What we've seen is that the commission has been obviously swamped with claims which is not surprising, given the history of forced removals, given the imposition of incorrect tribal boundaries on communities, and given the, uh, given the contested uh, nature of traditional leadership, so people saying that this tr traditional leader is not the leader that we recognize, it's hardly surprising that the commission was inundated with claims. Because of that, the commission has at this point only managed to deal with the, the kingship claims which, as we know, is merely but the top layer of the traditional leadership um, issues and the traditional leadership claims. Even in dealing with those kingship claims, pretty much every single one of the Commission's findings has been challenged or is currently being challenged in court. Not only are people claiming that the findings of the Commission are invalid, but there is some serious concern about the mechanism and the approach that was used by the Commission in determining these uh, kingship, kingship disputes. The Commission has leaned towards relying on a very strict genealogical approach um, and an almost formulaic approach in the way in which they decide each of these uh, individual cases. Um, so this genealogical approach is deeply problematic because it's obviously been manipulated by the people who were dis deposed um, and those who are independent. Um, and in order for them to be able to gain the type of support that they need in order for them to be able to go forward with mining deals. So a very classic example of this is um, the style case, which I, I will speak to a little bit later, but in that case, um, the traditional leader, the, excuse me, the king who was uh, deposed was a king who was opposed to the uh, mining and the into gateway, uh, into toll road projects um, in the Pondoland area. And the king that was put in his place and was recognized was somebody who was amenable to that mining deal um, and seemed to have connections with the presidency and the right type of people. So you see really that the Commission's findings um, are quite open to this type of political manipulation um, and the Commission's approach certainly doesn't lend itself to uh, findings that are deemed valid by the communities themselves. So you see then that the second uh, safety valve mechanism is perhaps in even more disarray 
than the first. So we come then to Section 20 of the Framework Act. This is um, really quite a hidden bombshell in the Act. Uh, it is the part of the Act that lays out the roles and functions that can be given to these traditional leadership structures. What is important to understand about the Framework Act um, is that it doesn't actually give traditional leadership structures or traditional leaders any powers. It lays out the definition for what, what defines uh, a traditional leader and a traditional council. It lays out the composition requirements. It lays out the processes for recognition, so how a traditional community gets recognized. But it does not actively give them any power, except for Section 20. Section 20 doesn't give them power by its mere existence in the Act. But what it does provide for is for powers to be given to these structures through the process of legislation. So while the Framework Act consolidates the old boundaries and structures, it doesn't provide direct powers. Instead, you have Section 20, which provides that national and provincial government may provide a role for traditional councils or traditional leaders in respect of a listed area. Now, what's up there on the slide is only a few of the listed areas. I think there are at least sort of 10 to 15. But it's things like arts and culture, land administration, agriculture, the administration of justice, the registration of births and deaths, it really is a wide list um, of, of areas in which these structures can be given a role. So we come then to why it is that Section 20 is so important. And it's about this tension that Aninka has alluded to um, in her presentation between status and role or powers and functions. Now, status and role is, is the phrasing that is used in recognizing traditional leaders in the Constitution. The Constitution says that traditional leaders um, are recognized, and what they have is status, and they have a role. But what they actually wanted was powers and functions. And so while the Framework Act itself does not give them direct powers, it does allow for roles to be given through legislation and through the legislative process. And as I'll mention later, the traditional and Khoisan leadership role will shift that emphasis from legislation to uh, from law to, to them being able to be given powers through delegation, which raises its own set of problems, but I will come to that. So the background to this, this, concept, this conflict between status and role or powers and functions is that the Constitution itself speaks about status and role, not powers and functions, which is why um, the IFP and Contra Lesa launched uh, a challenge to the Constitution and why you have in the certification judgment the reaffirmation and the upholding of the fact that the words that would be used in the Constitution and the recognition given is one of status and role, and that that is sufficient. Section 20 then created what one could almost describe as a backdoor way of giving them powers. So it was almost like saying, okay, fine, the Constitution only allows status and role, but we are going to give you actual powers and functions through this Section 20 and through the pieces of legislation that Section 20 will allow us to enact. And interestingly, thinking about the CADESA exercise that we did yesterday, what this really highlights for me is the way in which uh, the ANC delegation was really trying to almost sort of please everybody. So, you know, it, it feels like Section 20 came about as a way of saying, it's okay, we've got you covered, don't worry, we won't, we won't compromise. Uh, so the jewel in the crown when it comes to, to understanding Section 20 is that what, what the mechanism is that is used to give traditional leaders powers and functions is by attaching power to land. And so what, uh, what you see is that traditional leaders were ready to reject the Framework Act as giving them too little power. Obviously, delegations like the IFP were really intent on traditional leaders having um, a very significant uh, amount of power um, in, the, in the new government going forward. And so you had threats to boycott the elections and you had the interdict application from those parties. There was then uh, this cabinet deal that, as I understand it, happened under Minister Togo de Diza, where the uh, CLRA, the Communal Land Rights Act, which was at that point the first piece of legislation to be passed under Section 20 of the Framework Act, the promise was made that it would be amended in such a way that it would give the traditional councils the role as the land administration committees. Now, you'll, remem you'll remember that under the CLRA, these land administration committees had the power to represent the communities. And so they, that was how traditional leaders would be able to assert power over land. 
by knowing that their traditional councils would be the land administration committees with the power to represent the community. Um, the provincial laws that uh, have been enacted under the Framework Act are the laws that repeal the various homeland laws, like the Bantu Authorities Act. Now, in order to get the provinces to repeal their laws, they needed the buy-in of the provinces. And so in provinces where you have quite a strong traditional leadership lobby, like in KZN, you were sitting with a situation where, because KZN was ha unhappy about the amount of power that was given to, to traditional leaders, it seemed unlikely that they would be willing to repeal their provincial laws. Now, in order to appease them, you could, the, the government decided to amend CLARA in such a way as to give them more power, and that enabled them to get the buy-in that was necessary to get the provinces to agree to repeal their, uh, to appeal their um, apartheid laws. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Oh, okay, so it was the CLR, when the CLRA was a bill. Sorry, yes. So, I'm sorry. So there's references to CLRA should be CLRB then. Um, so, yeah, this is during the negotiation of shaping the communal land rights bill. Um, so once CLARA was amended, they were able to get uh, a lot of buy-in from the provinces, um, given that they had now uh, fulfilled their promise um, to give traditional leadership structures more power. Um, so it was really a, a carrot and stick approach. It was a case of you will be given a mechanism to exercise control over land, but only if you accept the composition requirements and you repeal um, your homeland legislation. So if you do this, you will get that. So the CLRA and the TCB as products of Section 20. Um, so as I said, so I, I suppose I should be referring to it as the CLRB. Um, the, the, the communal land rights uh, bill was, was the piece of legislation that would deal with communal land in the former homeland. Um, and that it, it had the ability to, to transfer title to um, these traditional communities. And then the powers of land administration and allocation would vest in traditional councils in the form, traditional councils which would be the land administration uh, committees. The CLRA also allowed for the title deeds of those land-owning groups, so groups that had bought their land um, themselves, to be endorsed over to the larger tribes, so to the larger traditional communities, thereby giving uh, control to the land administration committee and to the traditional uh, leadership structure over the land of, of landowners. Um, and of course, this endorsement of title is quite a uh, flagrant breach of 25.1, people's right to property. So uh, given that these land-owning groups had purchased the land and held title or ownership um, of that land, endorsing that title to a larger institution um, was uh, essentially uh, stripping them of their ownership rights. The justification for this move, the justification for why it would be okay to endorse the title of smaller land-owning groups to the broader tribe was that title was not something that existed under customary law. And it continues to be a justification that you're hearing even today. This idea that title, this thing of individual ownership, is not something that exists in customary law, and therefore it is fine for um, the, the current communal land tenure policy to speak about just giving households uh, use rights and endorsing the outer boundary and the outer title to the traditional council. Um, this, of course, results in, in lots of, of massive problems for groups that lived within these tribal boundaries. And Inca spoke um, uh, quite at length about some of these communities, so I'm not going to go into them in depth. But, for example, you have people who purchased land in the Kalkfontein area um, who would then have had to have their uh, title deed endorsed to, I think it's the Nzunza Pungucha um, tribal authority, which is not a structure that they recognize. Um, and similarly for the Makuleke, um, who are also, uh, who are having been put under the wrong tribal boundaries, they would then find themselves um, having to submit to a traditional authority that is not one that they recognize. You then had a second attempt at giving traditional leaders powers under Section 20, and this was in the form of the traditional courts bill. So the traditional courts bill would have given uh, these traditional leadership structures a role and in the administration of justice. Uh, the TCB, which, as we all know, was defeated um, through the activities of, of civil society, but especially through the activities and the submissions of communities, um, and it has not been passed. It was repealed in 2014, or early 20, yeah, 2014. Uh, sorry, not repealed. Uh, it, it lapsed in Parliament in 2014, so they were unable to pass it in Parliament, 
because they were unable to get the necessary amount of votes that they needed from the National Council of Provinces in order to pass the bill. And that is purely, purely because the provinces could not go against the mandates that they had gotten from, their, uh, from the communities within the provinces. Um, the TCB would have made it an offense to not appear before the traditional court if you were summoned. It would have allowed, um, amongst its list of punishments, it would have allowed for forced labor. Uh, amongst its list of punishments, it would have allowed the traditional court to deprive people of their customary entitlements, which is a, quite a broad thing, but could very easily mean that it could have deprived people of their rights to land um, and of other entitlements that are due to them um, as members of the community. Uh, the decisions and the status of the rulings in a traditional court would have been equivalent to that of a magistrate's court. It would have had the power to punish under uh, customary law, and it would have had the power to actually define what is the content of customary law. So the traditional leader or the presiding officer in the traditional court would have been given this uh, triple sort of role as both uh, the person who passes the judgment, who adjudicates, and who enforces the punishment. Um, women were unable to represent themselves. There was a, a, a provision in, the, in a clause in the bill um, that said that a woman can represent her husband in the same way that uh, a husband represents his wife under customary law. But of course, everybody knows that in practice, that would not have meant anything for the situation of women um, when they appeared before these traditional courts. And the bill did not allow for opting out. So it would not have allowed a person to decide to not use the traditional courts or to not use the customary justice system, but to take their, um, their issue or their dispute to a magistrate's court or to another forum. Um, so as I said, that bill was also unsuccessful. So what becomes very clear is that through the CLRA, which uh, the Constitutional Court struck down on procedural grounds, and through the TCB, um, the Framework Act, Section 20, allows for the setting up of a separate property regime and a segregated legal system. So the CLRA sets out a property regime that makes it very clear that people in the rural areas would be operating under a different system of property rights. There would be a system in which they do not have ownership, and it would be a system in which their property rights um, were subjected to the whims of traditional leaders, which obviously creates quite a, a clear distinction between those who live in quote-unquote urban areas where they are, are governed under a property system that recognizes and protects their ownership rights and where they're not subjected um, to the whims of any outside structure that they may or may not recognize. The traditional courts bill, in, in the same way, would have set up a separate legal system, um, a system that would have denied and made it more difficult for people to have equal access to the law, and it's a system that would um, have denied people the ability to opt out. It would have denied them the, the ability to exercise choice. This clearly goes against the Constitution and against the constitutional promise of one law for one nation. It goes against the very essence of what people were struggling for uh, during the height of apartheid, the idea that South Africa is one country and that all South African citizens are of equal footing. Instead, what you see through these laws is that some people are treated as citizens of South Africa and others are treated as subjects, to borrow from uh, Mahmoud Mamdani. So uh, I come now to the fact that we're all very well aware of, that the Framework Act is set to be replaced by the traditional and Khoisan leadership bill. Ostensibly, this bill is about bringing the Khoisan into the fold, bringing it into the same framework um, of recognition that has applied to traditional structures until now. But it does this on a very different basis. I'm not going to elaborate too much on this, but safe to say that the recognition um, of traditional leadership for the Khoisan is based on a jurisdiction over people rather in comparison to the recognition of traditional leadership over so-called African people, which is based on um, uh, a recognition of geographical boundaries. What this, uh, the traditional and Khoisan leadership bill is also attempting to, to do is that it's attempting to get around this issue of the invalid traditional councils that I spoke about earlier. So it would appear that the department has cottoned on, that they are facing a potential problem with their traditional councils, and the traditional Khoisan and leadership bill allows them um, another opportunity to try and correct that problem. It's also an attempt to give traditional powers, uh, traditional leaders powers by delegation. So as I explained, the Framework Act currently, which is the current law, requires that um, powers and uh, functions be given to traditional leaders through the passing of legislation. Now what that means is that you've got to have the process of passing a piece of law through Parliament. 
which will always in involve a public participa participation element, which means that people have an opportunity to comment on and to oppose the piece of legislation being passed. If um, this is done through delegation, which does not require public participation and is not the same as the legislative process, um, it makes the ability to track the types of powers and functions that are given very difficult. It makes it harder to know which department has given which powers to which traditional leaders and how that's playing out in each of the different provinces. So it's an inherently more hidden pro process, um, and it's a process that means that uh, people's ability to use those public spaces and those public processes is going to be hampered because those are going to be taken away from them. And what you've really seen, uh, just to say that, what you've really seen with the uh, the legislative process, so the, the process that's envisaged in the Framework Act, is that people have really taken to claiming these public spaces. The opportunity to comment on legislation um, is one of the areas in which we've seen the ARD and other networks really exercising their muscle um, and holding the government to account. So it would be tragic, really, if the bill allowed for that to be lost. So I come now very briefly to the living law jurisprudence. Um, this is the series of constitutional court judgments which have played a very profound role in shaping um, what this country means when we speak about customary law. So the constitutional court has made it very clear that when we're talking about customary law in this current dispensation, we're not talking about the distorted versions of customary law that were created by colonialists and by the apartheid states. And this really is quite a radical break because uh, in, in, in um, adjudicating court cases, courts often look at precedent, which is that they look backwards in order to make a decision in the here and now. So for the constitutional court to say, with customary law, we cannot look backwards because if we look backwards, we're looking at a distorted, um, illegitimate version of customary law. What we have to do is we have to look here and now in order to, um, to make a decision in these cases. And it's, a very, um, it's something that I think lawyers probably struggle to wrap their heads around because it, it departs fundamentally from what has been the traditional approach to um, adjudicating cases. So the court really directs us to other sources to find the content of law. So very briefly, just to track the, the timeline of cases, uh, the very first case that came before the court was the Richterfeld case, Alex Court. Um, it dealt with indigenous ownership, and it's in this case that the court made it very clear that we cannot look at customary law through the prism of common law, but we've got to look at it on its own terms. Um, and the court was also very clear that customary law feeds into the amalgam, excuse me, of South African law. It becomes part of the body of South African law. It is not a separate thing on the side but rather it is a crucial part of the South African legal system. We then come to 2004, where uh, the court heard the Bear case. This is the case that dealt uh, with women's rights to inheritance and the rule of male primogeniture. Um, you have the very powerful uh, Pius Lange judgment in this case, um, in which the court considered the role of the Black Administration Act uh, of 1927, which was the act that uh, held that when it came to uh, inheritance for black people, it would be governed by the 1927 Black Administration Act, and that act allowed for the rule of male primogeniture. Uh, come then to 2008, which you, where you had the Goumede case. And this case dealt with women's property rights and marriage, um, and it debunked the myth that women had never had land rights historically. Uh, then in 2008, you have quite a, a, a fundamentally important judgment, Shulubana, which is the case that um, was about the Valoi community who had taken a decision to amend their customary law to allow uh, Filia Shulubana to ascend to the, the position of traditional leadership. Um, and here the court really laid out um, what has become a, a, referential, a reference point for how to um, determine customary law and, and the role in which community developments of their own customary law, um, what kind of role that should be given by the court. So an extract from the case, reads that where there's a dispute over the legal position under customary law, a court must consider both the tradition and the present practice of the community. If development happens within the community, the court must strive to recognize and give effect to that development to the extent consistent with adequately upholding the protection of rights. The court also went on to say, customary law must be permitted to develop and the inquiry must be, must be rooted in the contemporary practices of the community in question. So it's about looking at what the community is doing in the here and now um, and allowing those developments to inform the way in which um, customary law develops and its shape um, and affording community development uh, 
uh, its rightful status in, in, um, in shaping customary law. Uh, to continue with the timeline, in 2010 you have the Tongwane case, which as I mentioned was the case in which the Communal Land Rights Act came before the Constitutional Court. It was struck down on procedural grounds, um, which means that unfortunately the more substantive issues, so the, the content um, issues, were not really grappled with at length by the court, um, but it still is an important case. In 2013 we have Pilane versus Pilani, which dealt with the traditional community's rights of dissent and their freedom of association. In 2013, uh, you have the Sigao case, which I spoke about earlier, um, which was a challenge to the finding of uh, the Ndlako Commission on the Mbondo kingship. Uh, in 2013, again, you have Mayalane. This is quite an interesting case because um, in this case, the court was required to look at quite a, a number of different sources around um, Tsonga law um, of customary marriage. Um, and the court was, was, it was very interesting the way in which the court dealt with the different sources. So rather than seeing them, because they all presented different points of view, and rather than seeing them as conflicting, the court chose to view them um, as rather just offering up a variety of, of views, but not a, a variety of views that conflicted with each other, which again was, was quite an interesting approach. And then you have uh, last year the Bahatla CPA case, where the court dealt with the community's right to choose its own land holding structure. And again there, uh, the court was quite clear that where a community has made a decision around the, the land holding structure that they would like to use, one, uh, the court encourages that that be uh, adhered to. So very quickly in wrapping up, um, what, is, how, what, are we, what, is, what, are, what is the new laws, um, how do they contrast with living law? So the new laws are about entrenching the rejected apartheid structure, they're about centralizing power in traditional leadership, they're about locking people in and they're about keeping democracy out. And they're about creating a different system of governance for people in the former homeland. And they are about segre segregated property regimes and separate legal systems. And this is quite in contrast to living customary law, which is about the rules and processes developing as society changes. So it's about a fluidity and a flexibility and debunking the idea that um, customary law is a static body of, of law. Reflecting uh, the living customary law is about reflecting customary laws inherently multivocal and thereby democratic nature. So the idea that many voices can contribute to the shaping of customary law, not just the voice of one person, um, and, and this idea that there is a sort of a custodian of customary law and a person who determines the content on their own. Um, and that, ca that living customary law is a lot like language. Uh, its meaning is made by those people who use it. And as they use it, so the meaning shapes and is changed. Um, rather than having it sit in some official central location or some official central authority as the sole person who holds any influence over the content and the development of customary law. The new laws, therefore, one can argue quite strongly, are inconsistent with living uh, law jurisprudence and they are inconsistent with the Constitution. If the living law jurisprudence is about infusing customary law with constitutional values and democratic processes and affirming developments where they occur, um, and it's about opening up spaces and opportunities, then these laws are essentially about shutting down those spaces and opportunities. The laws um, deny the consensual basis of customary law, the idea that people affiliate by choice, and instead they superimpose tribal identities onto people. What is really key to, to understand about the laws is that whereas the previous basis for discrimination in our country was race, the laws structure it so that the basis of discrimination now is geography. So the, who are the people who are, who are living under a separate property regime? Who are the people who are living under a se segregated legal system? They're the people who form, fall within certain boundaries. They're the people who fall within a certain geographic uh, jurisdiction. And what you cannot break apart is the fact that that geography is absolutely at its core about race. And so in a way, these laws are about a, a different type of racial discrimination that's disguised as a geographic discrimination. Um, but ultimately, they are discriminatory laws.